South Africa is number seven in the world with regard to coronavirus cases. That have been confirmed by the health department now in South Africa. 517 infections. COVID-19 cases. 17 more South Africans have succumbed to the coronavirus. Cases in our country. The storm is upon us. COVID-19 brought a major change in how we look at food. The concept of food security used to be a very theoretical, almost an academic concept. COVID-19 in most of the third world brought about the fact that there isn't enough food. Food scarcity at the moment in Africa is a bigger problem than the COVID-19 disease. This, uh challenge would be much greater than everyone actually realized at the time. Everyday people need food. So that's why I'm saying uh, farming is very important. We, we must feed our people. I don't think that there is a solution that is cheaper um, and as universally usable as the solution that is being put on the table by CFA. In any disaster situation, people are stretched beyond their ability. When it comes to any kind of disaster response, that is uh, the first things that we, we look at. Are, are people safe? Uh, do they have a safe place to stay? Do they have food? Do they have water? Um, so that is, that's a, a common thread that you can see runs through all kinds of disaster situations. And now with the COVID-19, in the weeks and months to come, we, we might see even a bigger knock-on effect um, because those basic needs won't be met and we will have to do that. Someone will have to fill that gap in the market or people need to do something else within their um, abilities to ensure that they, they do have food. Big crises, you've got the innovations. You've got the wonderful plans that people are making. We think at the First World War, a few people would realize that the whole concept of camouflage is from the First World War. The aeroplane is from the First World War. In the Second World War, antibiotics, radar, they were all created in crises. Wars are typical crises. With COVID-19, I think we've developed two or three things. We have digitized everything. Zoom is now part of our language. Social distancing is part of our language. And to care for people and to see how we can sustain societies is totally different now after COVID-19. Probably what we need to do is we need to find a product that is as affordable as possible and also that needs as little added to it as possible. We basically had only one place where we could go to find that product and that was at CIFA. started about 22 years ago uh, with research that we did at the university. I started with postgraduate studies. It developed from a research group within the university up to 2007, if I remember correctly, when it spun out of the university as a commercial enterprise. And from then, we've been driving it as CFAM Technologies, supplying quality extrusion equipment to, to Africa and the world. dreamt this would be the end result. Um, that's what we worked to, because um, we initially focused on the extruder itself, but industry doesn't want a specific machine, and then the customer has to put everything together into a plant that produces whatever product. He wants a sort of a one-stop service that, that a single entity or a single organization is responsible from start to finish, making sure that the product he gets is the one that he wants. So the extruder is, is the, the core part of the processing plant for sure, but, but the, there's very definitely a demand from industry for a, for a turnkey solution, pre and post extrusion, all together into a processing plant that, that does what it's supposed to do. 
CFM Technologies manufactures the equipment itself and also the processing equipment that goes with it. So the business starts with the manufacturing of the equipment that you're going to need at the end of the day for you to be able to produce a final product that would be ready to eat that uses less energy as well as less resources as well. We believe that, that we are at the beginning of a, of, a, of a very good growth curve within Africa specifically. It's important to understand that it, Africa is a completely different scenario to Europe or the States. In the sense, it's difficult to find skilled people in Africa. The, the requirements of, of the operators of a plant is different to the States. Over here, it needs to be dependable, it needs to be easy to control. Um, a lot of the logging and the quality control and so on needs to be built into the system because you don't necessarily have the people to do that uh, in the traditional way. Which means the whole philosophy on how you design a plant, I believe, is different in, in Africa compared to, to the States or to Europe. And, um, and I think that sets us apart. And also I think it finds uh, the rest of the world is starting to take note Listen, the fact that it's out of Africa doesn't mean that it's not on the edge and that it's not world class. And the feedback that we've received from, from experts in the field, from the States and from all over, is actually well, what they see at CFM they've never seen anywhere else in the world. And I think that is a, that is a, a feather in our hat. And that's what, that we, that was, that's what we are aspiring to, that we're really world class. The Extrusion Sustainability Circle basically encompasses all the aspects of the whole industry around extrusion. So first of all, we sit with the natural resources, the grains that are being produced on the farm. Now for that grain to grow, we're getting the energy from the sun. So the sun effectively supplying us with the energy for the plants to grow. From there, that energy in the plant then goes to the processing plant where we supply the grains and then the, it is processed and beneficiated into a more valuable product. The other reason also why we need to process those products is the reason that because we as humans need to eat cooked food. We cannot digest uncooked grains and pulses. From the, the processing plant we're sitting now with a value added product which is then distributed through the net network to the end consumer. So that is the whole process then effectively from energy flowing from the sun all the way into the grains, to the processing plant, through the distribution channel, to the food that in the end we eat. And we eat the food to get energy. So that's the energy flow. Now going backwards across that flow is the money flow stream. So that's the money that the end user pay to the distributor, the distributor pays to the processing plant and the processing plant buy the food once again the raw materials from the farmer and that creates that whole sustainability circle which then just goes on and on and with the sun supplying all the renewable energy to the system that creates us then that sustainability circle which can grow and grow and become stronger and stronger and that is also why a sustainability circle and a way looking at extrusion in overall can become a very important player in the economic revitalization of the developing world after COVID-19. Farming is all about management and the right management. And then again, um, you have to use what God gave you. And God gave you the sun. God gave you water and the soil. And if you have those circles to compete and to, to get your, your crop growing, and, and I'm on a no tillage basis, and no tillage is to have the microbes working for you, to have the, your soil drinking the water. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new technique that started off in Argentina, and I think it's, it's penetrating the whole world. And Africa is the perfect place because we have the best soils, we have good water as well. So we must just learn how to use this God-given soil, water and sun. 
to, to create our crops. We are in the age of technology um, uh, at the moment, uh, or the century of technology, and uh, there's products and processes and uh, machines coming up in the market. It will change some processes of the past totally, and I think CFAM has a brilliant product in the, in the extruders and that can be used in different ways to add value to your uh, product. And even if you are a small farmer, you know, developing a process to, to sell your uh, products at, uh, at a higher value, it will definitely help to keep uh, more uh, small-scale farmers uh, on their land. Management is very, very important. If you are in farming, management is everything. You have to manage each day. And um, in terms of smaller farmers, they must have the know-how. And again, government doesn't uh, create the environment for commercial farmers to get involved with those upcoming farmers to make them commercial farmers that know how to manage. Because management is everything. And, and I think we have the best farmers in the world. Family is in my blood. I was born in family. I'm not doing anything without family. I'm, I, I'm living family every day. Yes, even my family, you can see my family are here every day. These uh, small boys are looking after the sheep every day. When they come to the school, they are here in the, in the, in the farm. So I've, I've grown up here, I love farming, I love farming. Here in South Africa, we have lack of funds. We are struggling to plant maize is a lot of money. It costs us a lot of money. Uh, when we go to sell this maize again, the prices are going down, that's, that's why we are not growing up because of the, 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 the maize and the sunflower prices are changing every year and every year. Every day people need food. Morning, breakfast, uh, lunch, supper is food from the farmers. We can feed our uh, communities with our own resources. So that's why I'm saying uh, farming is very important. We, we must feed our people. farmers arrive here with a maize, they deliver it and we store it into the silos until we need it and then we draw it from the silos and we actually take it to our bin where we are going to hammer mill uh, the maize and as soon as we have hammer milled the maize at this stage we get the fine maize milled here uh, which is still in a very raw form and then we take it from the fine maize we take it to our extrusion process where we are going to cook it. So as soon as we take it from our milling phase, we take it to this holding bin and we add it to the holding bin and after we've added it here, it goes to our extrusion process and in this phase we actually cook it in 30 seconds. In the extrusion phase we actually get the final product out that looks like small cooked pallets and then we take it through our blowing system. So when it uh, arrives at our counter flow dryer, we blow through air through it in order to reduce the moisture to go to the hammer mill. And as soon as it's gone to the hammer mill, it goes to our mixing station. Okay, so when the product is milled, it goes into the bin. So at this phase, we sit with extruded cooked maize. So we went from, from the farmer, going through this whole process and ending up here with the extruded cooked maize. So in this bin, we have the sugar, which is added, and then we add it to our mixing bin. So in this case, you get the extruded cooked maize, you get the sugar, and at our microfeeder, you get the vitamins and minerals, your flavoring and your skin milk powder which is mixed together and then dropped and going to the packaging. So at this phase, 
when the porridge is all mixed together. We take our polyprop bags, we bag the porridge and then we stitch it and after stitching it we take it onto the conveyor and onto a pallet and pack it and palletize it. CFAM was established as a spin-off company of the NWU in 2007 to commercialize and further develop the technology. One of the products manufactured using the technology is a maize porridge which contains sufficient nutrients to meet the recommended dietary allowance. All porridges are also fortified with essential vitamins, minerals and immune boosters. When you develop a product, our aim is really to provide a nutritious, affordable product at the end of the day. And in this case, especially the porridge that we developed for the COVID-19 crisis um, and through the hunger stages that we have and poverty, we really try to make our focus on the, on the micronutrients as well that is essential to strengthen your immune system. That's why we developed this porridge in order to have 17 essential vitamins and minerals in it we added a lot of vitamin A's, B's, C's, D's and E's and we also added um, minerals, in this case iron and zinc and selenium that really contributes to taste and um, uh, smell at the end of the day and strengthening your immune system. The porridge is fully cooked in an extrusion factory. Extrusion is a continuous cooking process that is ideal for producing large amounts of food. The high cooking temperatures and pressures ensure that the food produced is sterile and thus safe. The CFAM factory has the capacity to produce 240,000 meals per day. There are more than 60 extruders operating in Southern Africa and plants are being erected in Canada, Northern Ireland and Pakistan. The prepared porridges are packed in 5 kg polypropylene bags with plastic liners for improved food safety and longer shelf life. The open edges of the bags are folded and then stitched for enhanced protection against insect infestation. A single family bag will be enough to feed a family of 5 for a week. The product will last for 6 months if the bag remains sealed. For a meal of 250 grams, mix 50 gram dry porridge and 200 ml cold water or milk. The cost of such a meal is only one rand and no additional cooking is needed. The 5 kilogram family bags are then loaded and transported directly to the consumer. For any product development process or product optimization process, it is really important to have uh, definite guidelines in terms of which attributes to increase or decrease in order to capture consumer preference. So in order to do that, we need to measure the sensory attributes that's present in the product um, to be able to quantify that, to be able to do statistics on that, and more importantly why we need to have an independent service provider such as SenseLab is to have an opinion that is absolutely unbiased and objective. We work according to an experimental design where products are served in a randomized order with three digit blinding codes to be able to make sure that they have no idea what they're testing. They would in this case for example know that they're testing cereal but they won't know what the client is or um, exactly the, why they're doing the tasting, they just know they're tasting cereal. Um, in this case with the cereal that we tested for CFAM, we had a specific gram to uh, liquid ratio. We measure off the um, cereal within that specific ratio parameters. We measure off the water and during the tasting, the panelists add the water to the cereal so that we know that um, each sample has been prepared fresh um, because you can imagine that if we um, prepare the samples beforehand, the, some of the cereals might get sticky, some of them might get thick. Um, so we want to be, it to be as consistent as possible. So we um, then serve the products in a randomized order to our panelists and they have to taste it in the order that we served it. So the reason why we randomized is because we get serving order effects. If you taste a very sweet sample after a very bitter sample, the perception of sweetness would be different. So and that's why we randomized the samples according to an experiment design. We have to make sure that we are neutral in ourselves 
so we try not to wear perfume or drink anything or eat anything or even have a smoke or anything beforehand so that we don't smell of anything or have anything that could confuse us. I know you know that it's, it's nice, but what else do you taste? Is it sweet? Is it very sweet? Does it taste like mint? Try to think about what you're tasting. What exactly does it smell like? What does it make you think of? Those kinds of things. The first appearance, you look at the color and the, the grain size. And when you mix it with the water or milk, and you have to have a, a vocabulary library to describe what you evaluate. We typically work with either marketing managers who want to know how their product compares to um, other products in the market, or product developers and winemakers who want to know how they can improve their product or change their recipe. So in some cases we work with um, big household brands, in some cases we work with um, products that haven't been developed yet. So there's a room for everyone in the Sense Lab family. Santi Brits uh, from the municipalities is a councillor and Hans-Juri Moorman also a councillor um, contact me and, and said is it possible that uh, the Chamber of Commerce can get involved because there's a huge humanitarian um, challenge coming our way. So uh, we went down and sat, sat with them in a meeting and uh, we uh, find out from them what the needs are and then as we go along we went out and, and uh, uh, said for ourselves that this uh, challenge would be much greater than everyone actually realized at the time. Uh, at, this, at the beginning it was only for three weeks so we thought you know, after three weeks it will take a month or two to get the people back and uh, to get them in a position that they can provide for themselves. But um, as the COVID goes on and it, it was extended and at the end it, uh, we realized that um, there will be huge hunger. Um, so that is where, uh, we, that's where it started. So we went to the chamber and uh, go to our members and ask them to get involved. And we use our network to uh, get to, to farmers, doctors, lawyers and business people in Pochestrum and the area to get involved um, and the, the beauty was everybody just started um, and, and either provide us with some maize or money or in fact some big businesses also got involved like Nestle providing us with a huge sum of, of uh, dry milk powder. Um, yeah, so there was a, a lot of people that also contribute their time, you know, just to say we want to make a difference, we want to help the people in need to get through this difficult time. With the infrastructure and the factory of Dani and Elia, we could, we could manufacture quickly and uh, with the help of, of all the volunteers, it was not that difficult uh, to, to pass that. But then the, the difficult, the most difficult part was to make sure that this uh, food ends at the places where it's needed. And that was the most difficult part. Uh, we got permits for everybody to make sure that they don't contravene the law and to distribute the food. So it was, uh, you know, it's quite a difficult task because uh, it take about, uh, it's for, to distribute 50 bags or 50, uh, food to 50 families takes you about a, a whole day, you know, just to go from house to house to make sure that you get the right people and it's different addresses and so forth. So that was quite a challenge. What I've realized uh, through this whole process is everybody wants to make a difference. Everyone, everybody wants to contribute, but they just need um, a system, a channel where they are sure that whatever they contribute ends up in the right place you know so uh, and I think the business chamber was that that vehicle where people can contribute and they are 100% sure that each and every cent that they contribute ends up as food you know, and, and uh, to get food on somebody's table for one rand a meal it is actually unheard of and uh, according to statistics in Africa you know about 17 cents out of every US dollar uh, that was donated in, in the U.S. ends up in food 
in Africa. So that ratio of 17 to 100, uh, in our instances it was one rand gives one rand of food and there was no logistics, uh, no, not if, if anything else that was subtracted there. So I think that actually uh, made a huge difference because it was a, um, a system that people could trust um, to make sure that every cent ends up as food on the table of the right person. CFAM has also developed a wonderful way of dispensing the porridge to the consumer by means of their food ATM. When you look at the rest of the efforts in the world of providing relief to communities, it's a very basic foodstuff. It would mean something where people would actually require to have energy to cook something. The logistics of transporting it, getting to the people would be a huge challenge. And I think this was overwhelming in the sense that this product actually filled, addressed all those issues. It was pre-cooked, it was, it was ready to eat. You didn't need energy to make it eatable. Um, and, and that was the beauty of it. Kruger National Park is situated in a very poor part of South Africa. Um, we've got about two million to three million people on our boundary and uh, they are really very poor people. We are uh, also looking at ways how to engage and assist our communities on a, just to improve their, their situation because they, they are neighbours and if they struggle, we struggle. So when we heard about this food, um, instant uh, uh, porridge, food ATM uh, uh, principle, uh, we decided let's look at it. Uh, we got a bit of funding and we said we're going to try and test it here in Skukuza because most of our staff actually are from the neighbouring communities. We believe that this is a solution and that's why we developed it so that you can help larger amounts of people without getting bogged down in the logistics of the operation. It turned out to be a good solution, a solution we've actually thought of a long time ago but opportunity didn't quite present itself to be so applicable to the current circumstances. It's always good fun when, when you've got this, this dream and this idea and, and we as a team bring it to fruition you actually see it work. So that, that makes it worthwhile. If it works here, if it is acceptable to our staff, if they like the taste of it, of it and the concept works, then we can start rolling it out perhaps to our neighbouring communities. The food is distributed with an e-coupon system. The e-coupon's unique number is sent via SMS to the cell phones of the persons that need to get the food. To manage social distancing, the recipient is also informed what time periods to collect the food. The e-coupon is only active during the indicated period. Each coupon is validated before food is dispensed. It therefore cannot be used again. The recipients of the e-coupon food are registered on a database. The immediate need is for governments, corporates and NGOs to get involved to establish food oases for communities in need. The food bank uses a rental business model. The food is refilled and topped up in bulk. The long-term solution is to establish regional extrusion processing plants that uses locally produced agricultural products to produce the foods. This will stimulate local economic development that will establish once again sustainable communities. Here we have a, a very good engineered piece of metal but how can we utilize that so that we can solve problems and then at that stage I mean 20 years ago we didn't know about the crisis that the pandemic would have brought but at that stage it became clear well this can be utilized in a very special way to use the crops that are produced in our area and rework it in such a way 
that it will be attractive to persons to utilize it. It's good for the, per the farmers producing the crop. There's a market, the market loves what they see. It is uh, sustainable, etc. We didn't know at that time that it would come to such excellent use, but it actually happened. And through the spin-off company that the university prompted and allowed at that stage, and the excellent work that was done, it became clear this is viable. Further research, uh, developing the processes, getting better machinery working, etc. Testing the product, involving other disciplines the nutritionists from the university, consumer sciences, and from the faculty of economic and management sciences to, see, to look at all the different facets, and I may even say, uh, especially now, also from the, the, the research knowledge we have in disaster management. Bring all of that together, and so it could happen, that uh, when the announcement came by our state president, it was less than two weeks. This unit was ready to produce, what was it in that first uh, couple of weeks, uh, 20, 30, 40,000 meals could be produced just like that. We've been working with uh, CFAM for almost a year now in uh, developing new concepts in, uh, in two or three different categories. And um, we've certainly found that with their ability uh, and their capability and their presence, uh, we found them to be uh, a good partner. As far as extrusion is concerned, compared to other technologies, uh, we found it uh, certainly the, probably the most efficient way of of beneficiating cereals and, and, and pulses. The equipment that we look at from CFAM can develop for us uh, seven different categories from baby, baby food to, to family cereals to snack bars to soya chunks to many, many categories. The great thing about that is you have one piece of equipment that, that um, is multifunctional if you like. We delivered food as far afield as Eerlands Bay. We delivered food in the Wetstorp in the Eastern Free State, in Fixburg, and, and places like that. That is now apart from the food delivered locally in Potchestroom. But the footprint of CFAM really became a South African footprint, and there's a lot of satisfaction in doing this as a project, knowing you can add to people's very, very dire needs in this crisis. I don't think that there is a solution that is cheaper um, and as universally usable as the solution that is being put on the table by CFAM now. And the fact that it uses basic foodstuffs, um, which are available all over Africa, I think just makes it the ideal process to work with. Using extrusion and creating a whole complete uh, sustainable circle of industry, we can actually create quite a number of jobs. So in a value chain that we're creating by doing this, we will create jobs on the farms, we create jobs in the processing plant where people do, uh, work in the, far, uh, in the processing plants, and then of course in the whole distribution channel. And then we can use also, because it's a ready-to-eat product, another opportunity is to actually start a whole informal distribution network where we use street vendors, for example, to sell to the final public. And then we have products like cup, uh, meal in a cup or meal on the go. And those are all new, innovative ways where we can actually create value chains and distribution channels where we actually keep that money within the community and not into the wholesale and retail environment. We were looking for money to start the project. We had the machines, we had the product, we had the technology, the innovation is, is, is synonymous with CFAM. And then um, Rotary came forward, especially the guys in Clarkstore. And with the money they provided early on in the project, like in the first week, 
we had enough to start the project. And with all of these kind of projects, if you have seed money, if you've got enough to start from then on, it's just maintaining and sustaining the project. And that is a very key role that Rotary played right at the beginning. And I think the big thing about the Rotarian is making a difference one person at a time, one day at a time. And you don't try and change the world in one day, but if you can change one person's life in a day, you've made a difference overall. To date, we've bought over 80,000 meals, at, which is 80,000 Rand, and those 80,000 meals have gone into the community where they have nothing. Now for them to get a meal at the price that we can afford to give it to them at and to know that they can go to sleep, one of the people phoned in and was crying to say that tonight they know some of the kids are going to bed with a full stomach, which is something that they don't know very often. Some of these people haven't eaten for three or four days. There's enough sustenance in one meal for a whole day. It's obviously not bulk, but it is enough sustenance. So from a, a nutritional point of view, at least, they're getting a full meal a day. And that is so, so important to us as Rotarians. That's what we're here for, and that's what we're doing. It's a service above self that we've been privileged in our vocations. So we joined Rotary in order to give back to the communities that we are based on. You know, identifying the needs that the communities have and trying to meet those needs as far as we can. What happened was that the, the farmers from the Vetsdorp donated 20,000 Rand and the Clarksdorp Rotary Club donated 13,000 Rand and that small amount of money was just enough to give momentum to the project and to keep it going at, to this stage where we have provided more than 5 million meals. It's a priceless gesture to see a smile on somebody who receives a meal. Sometimes we encounter people that are saying, I didn't know where my next meal will come from. So just hearing that, it, it's a priceless feeling. You, I can't describe it. I want to say thank you, thank you very much. They are God sent. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I'm so happy for them and I keep I like them to keep on doing their good work. I have a community in, in Kachin called Marikana. <clears throat> it's a very poor community. They, um, they live in a harsh circumstances. Um, and we went to deliver, deliver food to them. Um, and coincidentally, it was 30 bags of sea fan porridge. And for me, to see the gratefulness there, if I talk about changing you as a person, those images and seeing where a small thing can make a whole world's difference in somebody's life. It, it encourages you to do more. I think it, it's something you would like to spread to other people, to also have that compassion for other people, to do the small thing, not the big thing. Everybody wants to change the world, but to do the small thing for that one person that can really make a difference in their lives. Not a big thing, just a small thing. And it can do a whole lot for a small family life. There's very little in this world that you can do that means more both to other people and to yourself than giving back into a community and especially to people who have urgent needs that need to be met. Every person that you make a difference in their lives makes a difference to us. The joy on somebody's face, it's something you can't buy with money. It, is just, it just provides a sense of dignity. And, and that to me is a very self-fulfilling kind of thing. Many people have lost their jobs, many people had no incomes and a lot of kids that also dependent on the feeding schemes at schools also didn't have food for the day. So for CFM to take it upon themselves to help um, those communities um, was for me very empowering and it is also something that is a, a sentiment to actually the uh, uh, principles and values of, of CFM technologies.